Wave-catching daredevils, globe-trotters, and high-budget cinematographers, all people who can hear the call of the sea, obsessing over finding new adventures with the next great shot waiting to get filmed beneath or atop the ocean waters. The crew behind the 100-foot wave documentary heard that calling, and together with surfers, the Portuguese waves, and versatile camera technology, achieved the goal of filming greatness. Stick around today and find out about the cameras, gear, safety concerns, and all that it took to film 100-foot waves. The danger in filming 100-foot waves is absolutely staggering, and it's something that in making these videos on the Frame Voyager channel, we run into as well. The danger of a copyright strike lurking right beneath the water, waiting to knock us off our surfboard to success. <laughs> That's why today's sponsor, Storyblocks, is here to help us when we just can't find that right piece of content to fit into our video. And when moments of inspiration hit when you're editing a video, the last thing you want to do is take forever searching for the right piece of non-copyrighted free content, right? With more than 1 million royalty-free ads, assets from sound effects, music, videos, and more to choose from, Storyblocks makes it easy to hit those fast-paced production schedules that just seem to be getting faster and faster. They even have a plugin for Adobe Premiere that allows you to search their assets from the comfort of Premiere Pro and have it download directly to your project. It's awesome. So check out right now how Storyblocks can make your life easier as a creative today by clicking the link below in the description. Now back to some 100-foot waves. There is a saying in the surfer community that no surfer would be anything without a cameraman there to help capture their draw-dropping moments surfing waves. But surfing photography or filming is not something you just decide to do one day. Many are born with a passion for the ocean and being in the water. And for Emmy award-winning cinematographer Mike Brickett, that was certainly the case. You know, I was, I was a surfer my whole life. Um, and when I was really young, I, I got in a car accident and I broke both my legs and I got really messed up. And, um, I was taking pictures, but the, the doctor told me I should start swimming a lot to um, for my rehab. So I, because I wasn't pounding on my broken legs, so I started swimming. And then I decided, um, being a surfer, I'd always paddle over waves and see guys surfing. I would look in, and, and, and you'd see a different visual than people on the beach would. And especially when you get in big waves, you get to see these like unique perspectives that people didn't get to see, especially way back then. This was in like 1979, 1980. So I ended up taking my camera, it was a still camera back then, and I, and I built a really rudimentary water housing for it, and I started swimming and taking pictures with my friends. Filming in the ocean back in the early 1980s was no easy feat. Dealing with the delicate and limited nature of film was a massive challenge, especially when very few actually did it. Yeah, people have no idea, like, you know, like, especially shooting surfing, we would shoot high frame rates surfing. Well, you know, at least we thought high frame rates back then, you know, 100 to 200, sometimes 500 um, frames a second. You would get like one shot or two shots. You'd swim out with a, you know, like if you had a 100 foot load, it was like, like one wave. And you just had to make sure you got the perfect wave and you get it. And sometimes you'd have 200 foot load, you get a few waves. And then we had the bigger um, SR2s that we, we could have a 400 foot load. So when you pull the trigger, you made sure everything was perfect. And then, and then you had to hope for the best because you, you couldn't see what you shot. You had to go, go. Then sometimes you'd second guess yourself because you would send the film in to get processed and you had to wait two weeks to get it back. And you're like, oh, shit, did I open up enough or did I, I did have my exposure? What was that at? Or there was like, there was a hair in the gate. So it's completely different to nowadays when people like they go out there and they shoot all day long on a one terabyte card and they can rewind and look at it. And go, oh, it's perfect. And show somebody, is that what you want? It's like, honestly, a lot of times if it, if it was a big day, like if it was a 20 foot day and the waves are huge, it was like death to find to swim through the shore break and you get out and you're like, oh, you finally make it out there and you get all the way out and you get the shot and then you get a couple of shots and then you got to go all the way back in through the shore break and then change your roll of film. And you do that all day long. Nowadays, guys go out. And once they finally get out, they just sit out there. And actually, nowadays, guys just go on a jet ski. It's like they, it, back in the day, we just swam everywhere. There was no jet skis. There was nothing. And so it was like it was a lot harder work. But I think it was it was like good training. And I really appreciate the luxuries of, of jet skis and digital cameras and stuff now. And But I think you're right. It did, tra it did teach me a lot. And it teaches me to like... You know, you don't just roll on everything. You just kind of, you get the exact shot. And it was cool, too, because a high frame rate, I would remember you'd pull the trigger and the camera would ramp up and go. And so when you're pointing the camera, it'd be screaming with this loud noise. And it was exciting because you, you, were like, you knew you were getting this great shot. 
and then um, you know, and then it would disappear. I kind of miss it because it was neat. It was it was cool because it was so exciting to get your film back, like after two weeks getting it processed and stuff, and get it back. And, and then, you know, usually you nail it, it was like gold, and you're like, oh my God, it's just so beautiful. And it's not, and it, would, it just meant more and felt more compared to like the guys now, you like with, like, with my red camera, I shoot all day long, and I just, I just know it's there, and I just go in the digital, and that night I'm looking at everything, color grading it, and doing this and that. And it was just such a, such a different story back then, but it's, it, I, 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 we get more done now, but I do miss the good old days. From here, Prickett's career as a surf cinematographer would really begin to take off. And um, I would shoot surfing just nonstop, all, mostly 16 millimeter, super 16 and 35 millimeter film all around the world and video as well. And then they just kind of snowballed from shooting surf contests and my friends surfing to starting to do little little things for people and then commercials and then some little movies and TV shows. And then I started doing really big, gigantic feature films and I'm still doing the same thing um, today. So. Prickett traveled nonstop for over 22 years, filming everywhere around the world, slowly building up his techniques and expertise with filming, surfing, and underwater. But while scuba diving and filming for an upcoming movie, there was a diver who was in trouble that he went to rescue. I don't know if you know, but I ended up, um, I made a movie called Chasing Mavericks, and at the end of that movie called Chasing Mavericks, I rescued a diver, and I got the bends, and I got, and I got paralyzed. I was completely paralyzed from chest down, but now I'm paralyzed from the waist down. And um, people go, what? they go, well, don't you, aren't you bummed you can't go travel the world and do all this stuff now? And I go, well, I'm not bummed because I traveled the world so many times already. But come to find out, I actually continue to travel, even injured. Um, I'm going to Portugal. I'm leaving to Palau in a few days to go do a, a BBC Planet Earth shoot. And so, so it's like, yeah, it's, it's cool. Despite this life-changing injury, Prickett would still find ways to do the things he loved, including filming big waves and surfers. And the next challenge he took on was the largest and most dangerous yet, filming big waves in Nazaré, Portugal. Nazaré, Portugal is a typical Mediterranean town, making most of their income through tourism. In the summer, the town is sought after by foreigners and Portuguese locals alike in order to take a swim and sunbathe on the beach. But during the winter in Nazaré, just like any other tourist region, it's typically transformed into a ghost town during this off-season. The region had something special to offer though in the winter, which would be the big waves that form in the winter, which attracted dedicated surfers willing to take on a dangerous challenge. Garrett McNamara was the surfer who put Nazare on the map and is the main character in the 100 Foot Wave HBO documentary series. We will be covering his story on this video as you should really go watch this whole show yourself and the beautiful and deadly shots they got to tell this fascinating story. And then the, those guys reached out to me, the 100 Foot Wave guys reached out to me and they um, were talking about doing an IMAX film at first. And then, um, and then they were talking about Nazare and I know, Gar I know Garrett since he was young and I've been filming Garrett since he first started surfing. So they asked me about um, Nazare, and I said, "Hey, that'd be a great place to do it." And and and, um, and I know I've talked to Garrett, and I know how crazy that way he was, and the shore break is really crazy. So I knew it'd be an exciting place to shoot, but I also knew it'd be very dangerous. To make the camera systems operable in these dangerous waters, many custom enclosures were built to house their multiple types of cameras in order to film under and above the water. Underwater rigs needed to account for the potential of lenses fogging up underwater, and above water, it was difficult to keep those water droplets off the lens. A quick fix to this would be applying spit or rubbing a potato onto the glass in order to lessen the water droplets forming in front of the lens. For the big remote controlled gimbals, however, rain spinners were used to keep water at bay. Together with those enclosures, even drones were completely waterproofed, allowing the drone operators to try out riskier shots without having to fear the drone breaking upon submerging in the water. Well, we shoot, we shoot with the Red Monster a lot and, and the, and the V-Raptor, the new V-Raptor, um, you know, because you have 8K and then, and then, you know, also, you know, there's all these different kinds of stuff you can do. And then we got another big movie coming out and we're, we're really looking at this um, Airy 35 camera. It's not out yet. But you'll probably mm -hmm. you'll start hearing about it. So we're getting ready to build some water housings for that. We use a, a lot of those, like on the you know we do NCIS and Magnum PI and those kind of TV shows. So it depends on it. every show. Everyone has a different want. But um, for water stuff, I really like the Red Camera and the OLPF for that Red Camera. I think it just it's 
you know, the dynamic range, everything, it's really a nice camera to use. Speaking of cameras, an array of them were used for the series, including the monstrous Red Monstro, used to capture the big waves in 8K, Z cams and GoPros for capturing the point of view of the surfer, a Canon C500 Mark II for interviews, and any land-based footage which needed to be shot quickly, and additionally, a Phantom Flex 4K was used for all of the slow motion scenes. So, it, and it was hard to like try to, um, DP it all because you know I have like have 15 cameras running and trying to see everyone's image and, and help help everyone with their exposures. Um, it was very challenging for sure. And then there's a big fog there usually every morning, so there was a lot of light changes and everything like that. With all these cameras being used and the unpredictable nature of it all, they decided to film everything they could in 8K resolution. I felt bad for the editor and also the DIT because um, it's just like we just had such a mishmash of stuff. And then all the stock footage, a lot of the stuff that you saw, the old stuff, that was all shot in film. So that was like mm -hmm. 16 millimeter stuff I'd shot long, long ago when Gary was getting started. So we had film, digital, and uh, such an array of cameras and lenses and trying to make it all match up together. It was, it was difficult for, for the guy coloring and the editing. But in the end, safety was a top priority for the film crew and a dangerous reality that Prickett knew all too well himself. And the entire crew went through a ton of safety trainings and they even developed new filmmaking devices to help minimize the risk of crew members getting injured. Yeah, well, what, what, I knew that I, we had to be really careful with, I didn't want anyone to get hurt, you know, um, cause it's, it's a really dangerous wave. And if, and if you watch the documentary, it's really about everyone, including myself, everyone's like, you get all these, injured people, everyone that goes out gets injured. Usually the cameraman is getting destroyed, you know, um, and it's just getting the shot. And the camera, we, we keep a, a, a kind of a tight leash on the camera, to a, a leash from your wrist to the camera. We used to have a longer leash, but if it gets ripped out of your head and it spins around for surfing, the worst thing to happen is to get knocked out underwater. Um, so if you have a long leash and the camera gets out of your hand, it can spin around, it can hit you in the head and you can get knocked out easily. If you keep it close to your wrist, and before you get pounded, you're kind of keeping it down and close to you, you have a less chance of getting knocked out. And so that's a trick um, that you can use just if, if you know, because you have to have it, the camera's probably gonna get ripped out of your hands at one point. You can't not have a leash or you would definitely will lose the camera. So I didn't want to subject my cameraman too much to, to too much danger in there. So I, I did develop a, a remote control jet ski camera setup that would go on the back of a jet ski and I could control it from two miles away and I could zoom in, pan and tilt, and I had a, a gyro stabilized head on there. So it could, on the jet ski, it could be moving, but I could be, I could be surfing with the surfers, but it looked like I was on land. And so I could, I could kind of um, effectively um, get some really crazy water shots without risking too many people. I did have an, another water cameraman, Laurent Peugeot in the water, um, shooting um, a, a water angle from the back of a jet ski, just the old school way. But, um, and he actually did get hurt. He, it knocked out some teeth and stuff. Jet skis accounted for way more than just camera operation though, as they have been instrumental for safety in the sea. Thanks to these vehicles, surfers could conserve their energy and focus on riding waves without needing to paddle longer distances. And in the case of a wipeout or emergency, hundreds of meters away from the beach, a jet ski could reach the surfer or camera operator in need much faster, as opposed to a lifeguard swimming for up to 30 minutes before even being able to conduct a rescue. But yeah, I just, um, I don't know if you've seen all the injuries there. Just it's so it's so dangerous on the inside, and it's it, so it was hard to get um, those guys in the water in and out of the water safe, and then also not miss waves. So we had guys all up on the cliff and down on the beach below, kind of getting all the drama of the of the carnage. And with all that experience, risk, preparation, high-tech cameras, and more, they were able to create something that was truly magnificent and really show the massive, massive scale of those waves. The filming of the series would earn Prickett an Emmy for the fourth episode in the series. I never thought it'd be a career for me, and then, um, yeah, it's, I, I've just that's what I've done my whole life. Now I'm, I'm almost I'm, I'm 57, so I've been doing it for a long time, and like I've been doing it for 40 years, and I just I love every second of it. And I don't think I, I, I don't have any um, regrets of like going out to be a lawyer or a doctor or anything. I I, I, I think it was this was meant for me, and I, and it, I was so passionate about it that 
I loved every single day of working. In fact, I couldn't believe people were paying me to go out there and do what I loved. So it was really passionate for it. And I think for anybody, if they really love something like that, um, I think that's a, a good field to go into because you know every day, if you're doing a, some other job you hate, after a while you're gonna really hate it because you're going in just like, oh my God, but I, I never felt that. I, I enjoyed it and I traveled the world like so many times over that um, it's just, it's been a blessing. If hearing about how people film in dangerous, watery situations is kind of your thing, check out this video we did on how James Cameron used insane tech on Avatar Way of the Water. Michael Brickett even makes an appearance in this video, so go check that out.